on and we're going to kind of take a, a, a different lens, maybe look just slightly differently at, at this. So we're delighted that uh, Anthony Quigley of the Governance Institute is joining us. And Anthony has a long storied career as an entrepreneur and has set up and started many businesses and exited them, um, but has a particular focus on innovation and transformation. Uh, I'm dying to hear his insights. He's in conversation with Neve Sterling of HBank. Um, well, it's, it's, you know, you're right. It's, it's, it's a long and buried career. Um, I spent a few years in Microsoft um, trying, to, trying to understand how do we roll out uh, software on a large scale. Now, that, that you know, I, I, was, I, was, I had a great time in Microsoft, but Bill Gates was over. He was, he was giving a presentation in the Simmons Court, um, and he was talking about the future. Now, this was 1995. Um, and he was talking about wallets and uh, you know, digital phones. And these were, like, we had the Nokia 2110 at the time. Um, so he was really talking the future. And I thought, that's where my future is going to be. And I found myself over the years uh, moving into an area called EdTech, which is education technology. Um, and it's still, it's, it's a very fast growing area at the moment. And the Corporate Governance Institute is just another, another version of, of what I do, which is yeah. I bring... Um, new learnings to an existing market. You know, was digital marketing, uh, I've done coding, uh, UX, and now it's corporate governance. So what we're doing is we're just, we're just teaching people stuff, certifying stuff around the globe. We're, our, our, our markets are, are, are very global. There's directors everywhere. And fortunately, they're all making mistakes at the moment and they're in the newspapers for all the wrong reasons. And we step in and help them uh, improve what they do what their, what their businesses do and how they perform in the boardroom to think like a director, have a mindset with a, a, you know, an ESG thought process behind it and a culture behind it and so on. So that's, that's my background, I suppose. Yeah. You know, it's, it's all education for the last 20 or 30 years. Do you think having sat on the other side of the table has really helped when, you've, when, you, you, know, when you look at sort of setting up the Corporate Governance Institute and, and well, the Code Institute? Uh, no, it's, it's really interesting because you do get a perspective from both sides. You get the perspective yeah. from, from inside the huge corporation that was Microsoft. It was, it was the mid to late 90s, so it was quite a while ago, but it's, it was a huge organization then. And now what you've got is, you know, we've got 14 or 15 people in the Corporate Governance Institute. It's tiny. Mm -hmm. and so how do, we, how do we then engage with, a, with, the, with the likes of Microsoft uh, or the likes of Google? And, you know, the, the uh, Innovation Exchange is, is a great tool for helping us do those kind of things because you know Ryanair is, is involved in, in the innovation yes. decision. and so how do we engage with them is it is this something that they'd even want and we can find out very quickly without having to spend weeks and weeks and weeks or months sometimes figuring out who do we even talk to so yeah I was going to ask you that so what are the challenges for an SME you know a solution mm -hmm. provider getting mm -hmm. in the door mm -hmm. finding the right person to talk to yeah, I, I, I was thinking that you might ask something like that. And, and that is the hardest part. Yeah. And I think for, for, for certainly startup companies, one of the things you really, really do need to do is focus on the commercial aspects and figure out who's going to buy this. And is there somebody going to give me some money for this? Yeah. And if you get somebody to give you money, you probably have a product worth producing further. Uh, if you cannot find anybody to give you any money for it, then you probably don't have a product. And it's as simple as that. Yeah. You know, so the, the, the next stage is trying to figure out, well, who in this large organization is going to buy this? So is it, in my case, L&D? Or is it the CEO? Do I go yeah. straight to Michael O'Leary? Or do I go to the board? You know, we sell to the people who are on the board, by the way, which is a really hard place. Yeah, you know, who's on the board? We do, it's very hard to find them. So who do we sell to? Do we sell to L&D? But learning and development typically serve the staff we're focused on the board so in this case mm. so how do you how do you do that so so the innovation exchange helps a lot because it, it allows us to accelerate to the yeah. right person and if we're not talking to the right person then we know that we can bounce along to find someone else but sometimes it does it's it's understanding your own product understanding the persona that you're talking that you're that you're trying to sell to and figuring out that product market fit Testing it, iterating, testing, moving on, testing again, product market fit, try a different persona and, and really hone in and focus on those. those and that buyer, you know, these organizations are so large, they can be incredibly siloed. So mm. finding 
the buyer in that organization or across that organization can yeah, be incredibly yeah. well, different. Well, as, as Mark was saying, and, and, and yeah. Tim is here, who sells to sells to large organizations, it's it, it's fine. It's it it's moving between those silos and understanding what you've got. So we go back to the digital transformation idea, mm. which is every business is going through digital transformation, whether they like it or not, and they know it or not. You know, whether if you're if you're herding cows, you're going through digital Absolutely. transformation with the isn't it yeah. moo cow came out. Of, I think they were in the micro agri tech. Moo call, moo call, moo call, not moo cow. Uh, that's what they do. Moo call, I think. Um, and they, I think they spent some time in here, didn't they? Um, but they're they're innovating. Uh, the yeah. you know the how, how you milk cows. Now who would have, who would tongue uh, that that was possible? So. Um, so it's a matter of, of, of figuring out what do you have, which part of the organization, if it's a very large organization, is going through this, the, the challenges and the problems. And, you know, in sales, we talk about the pain point. Where's the pain? Where's the pain that they're going to pay to solve that and put, get the bandage and put it on? Or maybe get a longer term fix and try and fix it but they're willing to pay and they have the budget and yeah. they have the time and they have the pain. And that's the, that's the, that's the challenge. I suppose. Then looking at it from a large corporate perspective, mm. why do they struggle in terms of that, that full innovation process? Yeah, it's, 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 it's an interesting one. If you, if you look at large organizations, you realize how did, it, how did Unpost change? Yeah. Unpost had gone through massive change. Absolutely. Um, through Redmond. Isn't that his name? Yes, name? that's right. David, David. David McGrath. Yeah. And that, that's a massive, massive change. And they've moved into the banking and to, 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 to re, re envisaging the, the post offices and, uh, and they've gone into all kinds of new areas. Now, how do, they, how do they do that? That's very, very difficult for a large organization. Absolutely. You know, at the other end, Microsoft, for instance, buy companies. They, you know, if they wanted, they, they wanted to get into the Minecraft business, so they just bought it. They wanted to get into the software the pro- property get into the software storage um, and, and, and distribution space and they bought GitHub. So, but it's harder for large organizations. And, and you know, we talked about fintech and Mark, t- Mark talked about fintech. So why, why doesn't the bank allow me to do what Revolut, why doesn't the Bank of Ireland or AIB mm-hmm. or Deutsche Bank or HBS, HSBC, why don't they allow me to do what N26 does or Revolut does? And Revolut does an amazing job. And, um, you know, my kids have been on Revolut for two years and I was yeah. asking them, what's Revolut? Tell me about Revolut. Now, I'm addicted. You know, I, yeah. you can go into a restaurant and you share the bill on Revolut. That's mad. That's madness. But it should be done. And it should have been done years ago. And why, do, why can't the banks do that? And that's really what you're asking. Why don't large organizations do that? And I think what they do is they get bogged down. Yeah. And it's, you know, I'm sure there's a better term and there's a more uh, academic uh, process and reason, but they get bogged down. They do, are doing their stuff day in, day out. And I've seen the organizations that do develop, what they do is they actually develop separately. And what they do is they, they take a bunch of people and put them into a separate room or a separate building mm. or a separate company and say, go and innovate. And when they can't, they don't know how to, what they tend to do is they go and buy they buy somebody else who's innovating. Mm. So, and there's a lot of M&A going on in uh, FinTech at the moment, for instance. So the banks are trying to figure out how do, we, how do we compete with Revolut and N26 and so on, and how do we hold on to those customers who are rushing elsewhere? And the only thing they have at the moment is a mortgage and a lending. Um, all the other guys, they're basically debit banks, um, yeah. and, the, and, the, and my money flows in and out, but I, but I don't store any money there. Um, and, the, and they don't, they can't provide mortgages. So how do banks now start competing in those niche areas and they either buy or they innovate and they just find, I think, I think they're just bogged down. They, 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 they get into a situation where they're running around a, a treadmill doing their business without figuring out, without actually seeing how do I do this? And it, it, it's easy for somebody like me and you who's mm. an entrepreneur as well to see how they could do it. But the, it's, it's very difficult. And having been in Microsoft, it's very difficult to sit inside and, 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 and try and figure out, how do I go and innovate something? So, and even, you know, you've, you've, you run a company with a couple of hundred people. It's hard to change that company. It used to be called change management processing in, uh, in the 80s. Yeah. It's now, how do we innovate? How do we d- 
digitally transformed. And is it just about maintaining competitive edge in terms of, you know, why why is it so important for these, you know, large organizations to innovate? You know, cost, uh, uh, yeah, of course, yeah, everything we heard them talking, you know, Connor talking to uh, Mark earlier about everything from culture. It's not just, just their product. Yeah, but yeah. is it about maintaining, purely about maintaining competitive edge? No. They'll die. Yeah. They'll go bust. It's as simple as that. You know, there are, innovate there are, or die. Yeah, they will innovate or die. They will. I, th- I think it's as simple as that, which is if you don't innovate, if you don't keep up, if you don't change your processes, if you don't, um, you know, internal process, how do you, how do you, how, how do you move the customer from A to B? How do you uh, innovate in your mortgage delivery? How do you um, bring new medical products to, to market and so on and so forth? And if you don't continue to do that, if you don't do it faster than somebody else, and better than somebody else, and smoother than somebody else, you will go bust. Mm. I, I honestly think that's the way that, you know, look at GC, massive, or uh, not, sorry, not GC, uh, G- General Electric, <laughs> G, you know, the change there was so dramatic, so dramatic because they didn't innovate. And it, does that come from the top down? Uh, you know, I'll reference Microsoft again. You know, you've got uh, Satya Nadella took over as CEO from Steve Barmer. Steve Barmer was, uh, an interesting chap, um, <laughs> but he didn't do anything with the share price, and he and, and he he instilled a he instilled a culture of arrogance into Microsoft. Where Satya Nadella came along, within three months, they've changed. They've changed how they present themselves, who they present themselves to, and and the products and services and their culture. And that's innovation. That's change. And Microsoft mm-hmm. are not going to die. They they looked at GE and they said, hold on a second. We don't want to. We do can't do that. Yeah. We need to change in order to to uh, to uh, make sure that we remain leading edge. And they are now leading edge. They are, and they went through a whole dundra, uh, uh, period of uh, in the doldrums. Yeah, yeah. And taking a macro view then from from an Ireland Inc. perspective, how important is it that Ireland, you know, continues to to innovate and and uh, have programs like this? How important is it for? For us, as as a nation, yeah, I, I, on a world stage, you we're know. a we're a we're a small we're a small country competing for business, mm. and we're competing against Holland and Scotland and the Caribbean countries and South Africa. So we're out there competing, and we have to have whatever supports we can. And Enterprise Ireland does a fantastic job. The Leos at the lower end. Maybe that's not the right term, but you know the the Leos do a great job. The local enterprise mm. uh, enterprise uh, Ireland does a great job, and Innovation Exchange does a great job in turn in in providing part of that jigsaw puzzle. So the jigsaw puzzle, you know, we in Corporate Governance Institute may or may not get anything out of it. We don't know. We're just testing the waters with Connor and with the team and figuring out how do we who 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 do we talk to? How do we talk to the the enterprises? Can we do that? Do we have a product? Or a service that they want, um, but as a as a as a part of the jigsaw, I think it's really really important. Uh, and you know, skill nets have been doing this for for years. Mm. You know, Liz was talking about it. They're changing now uh, into you know expanding their services. So it's all part of the bigger picture. I think the challenge is not are the services there and the supports there. The challenge is how do we reach the SMEs and the enterprises and let them know that these various supports are going yeah. on. You know, even nowadays, there are startups who, don't, who, who can't figure out how to work with Enterprise Ireland or whether, where the supports are, are there supports, and how do I get those supports? And there's supports for food industry, there's supports for the agri-industry, there's supports for education, there's supports along the way for all kinds of industries. The challenge is, is actually how do, you, how, how do you find those supports? And it's the PR and the communications around getting those to the right people. Looking at what we're doing here compared to what's happening globally, um, you know, in in other territories and other geographies, how do we compare, say, to the US or to um, the Nordics or, you know, in terms of this this type of engagement? Oh, compared to the US, streets ahead. Absolute streets ahead. Um, You know, I'll give you a a tiny little anecdote, which is a guy who ran, I think they were called Pivotal Labs, Boulder, Colorado, and I met him. And uh, I was talking to him about the fundraising we were going through and how Enterprise Ireland were matching funds and so on and so mm. forth. And he was blown away. And then when I did some research, I realized 
there, I think there was one other country in the world who do that uh, matching matching funds and supports for uh, for growing companies and starting companies. So Enterprise Ireland was way ahead of their way ahead of their uh, uh, of their competition, as was the IDA. And this kind of thing here is way beyond. You know, you don't get this in France, you don't get this in Germany. I, I don't. I've not seen it in in the UK or Scotland as we as we travel. You know, we do a lot of business in Norway. Uh, Finland, Denmark, UK, mm. you know, uh, and I don't see this kind of support going on. You know, there are government agencies which provide grants and so on, but it's it's not that collaborative. The collaborative um, piece that we're talking about. Yeah, yeah. The, I, I don't see that elsewhere. I'm going to take questions from the audience and also um, um, from our virtual audience. So please feel free to to ask them before we, uh, I'll just say that now, before we uh, ask uh, Continue with Anthony. Mm. Anthony, just in terms of the future then for digital information, mm. how is that looking? Where are we, where are we going to go with this? I think Liz put it brilliantly earlier. We're going faster than we've ever gone before, and we're not turning back. You know, and I, you know, in, in Microsoft we used to say, "Well, change is constant. Change is constant." So you know, our expectations actually it's really interesting because we do a lot of business in B two C, business to consumer. Yeah, um, and expectations go up. Our expectations on booking a flight go up. Our expectations on getting to the airport have increased. You know, our expectations on, I want a taxi now. It's all gone up as consumers. And that flows through to businesses, be they small or large. Oh, yeah. It flows through our expectations in dealing with banks. Our expectations in <laughs> fundraising have gone up. You know, yeah. we're going through a fundraise at the moment. And my expectations are, I don't want to spend nine months doing this. I want to spend about nine days doing this. Yeah. That's it. Finish. Now, how do I do that? And it's... And three clicks. That's well, <laughs> if, I, if I can get two million quid in three clicks, I'd be happy. But do you know what I mean? It's yeah. like the expectation, even, even, even on a fundraiser. So, so, you know, if I was to raise two or three million quid 10 years ago, I know it would have been really hard uh, really laborious. I would have got 17,000 no's. Nowadays, mm. I'm making a few phone calls and figuring out, okay, who's got the best sort of money for me? Mm. It's not, you know, it's not quite, you know, here, you know nobody's throwing money, but, but it's so, it's becoming, so the expectations at all levels has, uh, has changed. And, you know, Stripe, for instance, has changed the expectation on, on uh, online payment. They just completely changed it altogether. Mm. And they still can't call themselves a startup. Absolutely, that's the mentality, isn't it? Million dollars. Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, look, I, I think we leave it there. Are we any questions? Yes. Hi, how are you? Come on. Congratulations on what you've done so far. Thank you. Um, I spent a, lot, a long time in South Africa and was working with uh, Mervyn King on the King Report around corporate governance. So I kind of understand okay. your field. And you've been talking about digital transformation, but directors are analog. Yeah. How do you make the connection between we don't run software. We make decisions emotionally and, as you say, yeah. based on thunks. Yeah. And there's lots of prejudice in the boardroom. Of course. How, how are you uh, yeah. dealing with that on your platform? <laughs> I'll add to that. The, the, Thanks. The, the uh, diversity and inclusion is all wrong in boardrooms. You look at any boardroom in Ireland and the UK and it's all pale, way, uh, pale stale, white, males uh, who are quite frail sometimes, you know. So, like, that has to change. That has to change. So when we were pitching, you know, this is a year-old business. When we were pitching in the be beginning, um, you know, one guy on the, on the call said, oh, I want to turn up in a, in a, in, you know, in a, a smelly hotel on a Tuesday in November at 7.30 and it's pouring rain and I'm cold, but I want to hear from the guy who's been in Shell. And I said, you're not my customer. <laughs> so to answer your question, my customer is people who actually think like you do and ask questions like you do. And yeah, they make decisions. They're making brain power decisions. But still, they have to understand the basics. They have to understand the foundation blocks. And unfortunately, the way directors have been hired forever is, he's a good guy. Connor, you, you know stuff. You come on our board, will you? And that's as simple as that. And that's how it always was, has been. So we're trying, to we're trying to change that. All we're doing is we're, we're, we're uh, using uh, innovation in how we deliver the education and certification. So the education certification up to this time has been 
Come along to a stuffy old boardroom, meet your counterparts, learn about how fantastic Shell was and GE was and Microsoft was, and we're doing it a different way. Do it anytime you like. Do it online. It's very flexible. You meet the same kind of people. They're all probably, you know, our audience is definitely over 45. There's some coming in in their 30s, but, you know, they're not 20s. Uh, but most of them are over 45, over 50. So how do, we, how do we innovate there? We innovate by delivering the relevant information very fast. So ESG is not available. Uh, this is amazing, but ESG is not available as a diploma anywhere in the world. Hurrah! Fantastic! What an opportunity! Because ESG is going to be with us for years. So we're going to roll out ESG as fast as we can. So... You know, that doesn't, how do, we, how do we get that into the boardroom? How do we get that new thinking into the boardroom? We do it through education. And that's what I mean by innovation without changing, you know, change. the change will then appear and will, will come to the boardroom. Um, you know, the interesting thing, by the way, is we're in, we're in business about a year. About 55% of our clients are, our delegates who have taken the course are uh, women. As opposed, to, as opposed to men, which is great. It's great. But, you know, if you think about boardrooms, what is it? It's 80% men, 90% men. So it's 55%. Now, why is that, by the way? That, that's what I'd ask. And we're trying, to, we're trying to figure that out as well, and we're surveying them and so on. But I think it's because 80% are, of the boardrooms are men, and there's a lot of women who want to get into the boardroom. So what they're doing is they're having to uh, certify themselves in order to present yeah. themselves as being able in the boardroom, yeah. and which, which is unfair, not right, but that's the, the I think, the fact of the matter. Yeah, absolutely. Does that answer your question? Uh, thank you so much, Anthony. I see Fergal uh, in the wings here waiting for us and, and Connor over my shoulder. Okay. I, was gonna, I was gonna say something about male pale instead, but I won't. <laughs> <laughs> Too late. <laughs> so listen, thank you so much, Anthony, thank you so for taking much. the time thank to you. talk to us this, this yeah, afternoon. Yeah, no worries. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks, Connor.